If there is no, or is there any, maximum age for marriage, but what is the minimum age, if any, for a female, and should consent always be sought? Is minimum marriage of age when they reach puberty, which can be anything around early teens, depending on demographics, geography, culture, era, epoch, space, and time? What was the age of the Holy Mother of Believers, Sayyidina Aisha, radiallahu anha? Was it six at engagement and nine at marriage consummation, or 16 and 19 respectively? There are ample authentic hadith sister in Bukhari where she herself narrates that she was six and nine correspondingly. And in Sayyid Muslim account, she reports unable to remember when she married. She was always with her girlfriends. Uh, playing on swings and with dolls, etc. Was that the culture where women married mature would play with dolls? Is that a sign of having reached puberty? Now, although there have been other alternative ages suggested by classical and modern scholars, i.e. Ibn Kathir, depending on maturity of her 10-year-old sister, Asma bin Abi Bakr, what were wonderful wisdoms, hikmah, behind her being the favorite wife, spending most of time with her, revelations being revealed in her bed, etc.? Why her in particular, not, and not any of the other more experienced mothers of the believers, where according to your authentic hadith, Zainab bin Jasha, on a group with some other wives, and told Fatima, on her regarding preferential treatment of Aisha, as well as episode of the honey sound in Quran, Majid. Second question, what was the wisdom behind marrying her after Hadija radiallahu anha passing away, given that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had already married Sauda bin Zama radiallahu anha? The Prophet was already a close friend of Abu Bakr, tight tribal ties. So why marry her at such a relatively young age when her older sister Asma lived until well after her? Uh, although there are many hadiths transmitted from her, there are others who have doubt uh, her narrations, for instance, in relation to whether the Prophet has seen God declaring Aisha as too young to be trusted with such narrations of Miraj. So what was the primary wisdom? Third uh, question, did all the holy wives of the holy prophet, radiallahu anhina ajma'in, cooperate with each other all the time? Or did they have their human coilings? Were they all united? Or did they have their own groups? Did the prophet give them all equal dowries, for instance? Finally, what uh, did the mothers of the believers do, and how were they supported after the Prophet, peace upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is passing away? How did Aisha, radiallahu anha, become comparatively so vocal and well known to the point of even standing up against fourth caliph Ali, radiallahu anhu, when the other wives don't appear so much in history? Did they all have their own houses? Would they have their own families visiting them, for instance, etc.? Please explain, explicate, expound, elucidate, elaborate, illuminate. Many thanks. Jazakallah khair. Okay, thank you for the calling in with those questions. Uh, okay, so I think uh, um, just uh, where to start from. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, with regards to this uh, question about uh, Sayyida Aisha, um, it became, as he mentioned, quite a sensitive issue now. Yeah, so I hope that people will understand what I will try to explain, inshallah. Okay, what is the age of consent? Uh, you know, uh, for marriage, a very girl to be married. Yeah, of course. The marriage is not religious matter, but it is social matter. Okay, so uh, that's why uh, when exactly normally uh, couples can marry. So Islam does not say marry at that age. Okay, but it is something that Prophet Muhammad, when he came, people were already performing this social act called marriage. Okay. And Prophet Muhammad, uh, only he exempted some certain oppressive types of marriages. Okay, but what about the age limit? It is just cultural thing. So if, for example, in our culture, in Uzbekistani culture, normally we marry in very young age. Um, so even, uh, for example, from the age of 15, uh, as far as I remember, the legal a uh, like permissible age in Uzbekistani constitution, in my uh, knowledge, it was um, uh, 17, if I'm not mistaken. And even before that, they used to do, but that would uh, be called as, you can say, um, uh, just cultural marriage. Yeah. But actual, you can say, contract, official contract would be uh, done after one year after the marriage. See, Islam yeah. doesn't comment on the, on the number. Yeah, yeah. You know, how old does the person yeah. have to be? But Islam would be involved when it, when it becomes a matter of exploitation. So yeah, yeah. if we're talking about extremely young girls and extremely yes. old men, yeah. that can't be right. Exactly, yeah. So, so anyway, and also another thing in our Uzbekistani culture, normally husband is older than the wife. Okay, but 
just next to us there is another country called Turkmenistan. Okay. Also, they speak in our language. You can say, uh, I mean, same religion and very close culture. But in their culture, normally, wife should be a bit older than the husband. So does Islam come to say, you, all of you are kuffar, go to ISIS to get your head chopped off? It's social thing. It is social thing. Okay. Islam does not say, do this. Do. It's just cultural thing. And you just follow your own culture. Okay. Uh, but what about... Let's say in this uh, African country in which life expectation is 30 years old. We do have it. Okay. In some of them 50. Okay. But some of them even 30. And in their culture, they normally even marry off very in very early age. For example, at the age of 10 or 12 or 15. Before the maturity age. Before, I'm sorry, before Islamic maturity age, which is 18, according to Hanafi Madhab, and other Madhab, they have got their own, uh, you can say, uh, limits. So, will that be permissible? So, according to our, you can say, understanding of Islam, we say the uh, marriage of immature kids will be only valid if their parents or guardians will set up that marriage. But what about the sexual intercourse? We say that should be done only after the maturity age. Okay, so that is the thing. Okay, so from here we understand that Islam does not limit the age. So if it is before the maturity age, it's not valid only if parents, father or guardian will set it up. But after the maturity age, they are free to do whatever they want in terms of whenever they want to set up a marriage, they are free to do. So that is um, in terms of one side, okay? Um, so means now we just go with the local culture, okay? So as long as there is no oppression, but what about the, for example, the age difference? I say that is also cultural. Islam does not limit. So Islam does not say that there have to be maximum 10 years difference. So if it is more than that, marriage is not valid. Islam does not say that. It is also a cultural thing. Okay, but as far as I know, in Egypt, for example, they say the maximum age difference should be 20 years. But if it is more than that, as far as I know, it's illegal in Egypt. So is that fine? We say Islamically we don't have any problem. So it is, again, cultural thing. So there could be that, for example, this lady at the age of 20, she can marry off herself to this person at the age of 50. So 30 years difference. Is that fine Islamically? We say we don't have a problem as long as that is acceptable in that locality. But it is it not oppressive, though, if a 70-year-old man marries a 7-year-old girl? No, oppressive uh, in which sense? In, in the sense that there's, she doesn't know what she's doing, yet she's married no, no, a 7-year-old. So, it, 7 years old. Mm. So, so if it is immature kid, so we say it, it's not valid unless guardian or parents will set it up. You understand? Mm. So it is the responsibility of the guardian to protect from the oppression. Okay? So that is from one side. So it is pure cultural thing. Mm. Okay? So that is about this one. But what about the <coughs> issue of uh, the next issue was uh, about the age of Sayyidah Aisha when she was married? You know, obviously the, the most predominant understanding opinion of Muslims as well as non-Muslims is what Imam Bukhari narrated that she was uh, six years old okay when she married and when she consummated the marriage she was nine years old and etc okay so obviously you know just let's clarify one very important thing obviously we have two-sided people now okay uh, one side is I would call them you can say the Bukhari people so for them, Bukhari is absolute, you can say, uh, um, absolute uh, head uh, and source of Islam. So even, by the way, these people, they went to that, uh, uh, you can say, level in which they say rejecting any hadith from Bukhari is nearly kufr. Okay, because normally I do get different type of uh, articles and emails in which they say that um, uh, a hadith of Bukhari, now it reached to the level of aqidah, belief. Why? So because if you reject anything from Bukhari, it 
could mean one of two. Either you are heretic or either you are kafir. Okay. Obviously, from my point of view, I say that I do not uh, keep Bukhari as absolute, you can say, um, reference and absolute, you can say, head of Islam. Bukhari, I mean, Islam existed b before Bukhari and it can perfectly exist even without Bukhari also. Okay, so that is my stance. Um, and also, so and also, same thing about Abu Hanifa. So I follow him in the fiqh and aqidah, but Islam existed before Abu Hanifa and it can exist without Abu Hanifa perfectly. Okay, and Bukhari and Abu Hanifa, there are two uh, scholars of Islam and we have many of them big number of all of them. So that is one side. And the second side, they say, yes, actually Bukhari is heretic, he's kafir, this, obviously I do not follow any of them too. In terms of the age of Sayyidah Aisha, we have this hadith of Bukhari, okay, and we have many other ahadith. The main narrator of the biography of uh, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu is um, Ibn Ishaq. Okay, so according to the narration of Ibn Ishaq, uh, Sayyidah Aisha, she was one of the early Muslims. Okay, early Muslims means before the migration, uh, 10, uh, 13 years before the uh, migration message started. So, uh, as a minimum, uh, so because she accepted Islam within three years in the beginning of Islam. Okay, means 10 years before the migration, she was on the age in which she could accept Islam. Okay, so now my question to you. So, um, just girl at the age of two, can you call her that she accepted Islam? Or can you call that she uh, be became apostate? Two years old, three? No. Four? Four years? Probably not. Five? Probably not. Six? Seven? Eight? So just can you give me just minimum age in which someone can accept Islam or reject Islam or accept Christianity or accept Judaism? It's really hard to give a number. Just minimum, as you uh, estimate. I don't know, maybe 16, I don't know. According to Hanafi Madhab, it is maturity age. Before maturity age, kid does not assume what is he doing. Do you understand? Mm. So it should be at the age of maturity for you to accept some religion or to disbelieve. Do you understand? So before the migration, before 10 years as a minimum before migration, say that Aisha was on the age in which she could accept or reject Islam. Ibn Ishaq classed, uh, mentioned her name next to the name of Abu Bakr and his daughter Asma and, um, uh, and uh, uh, Zaid ibn Harith and many other mature Sahaba as one of the people who accepted Islam means she was already mature when message started and marriage happened nine years after her accepting Islam. So now you can estimate. This is the narration of Ibn Ishaq. Okay, so then what is the uh, superiority of Bukhari? Is it the conditions? Well, for me, we do have Hanafis, we have our own conditions of accepting Hadith or rejecting them. So that's why we just do not consider the you can say the conditions of the muhaddithin or hum humbleis or shafis will have our own Hanafi conditions. So according to our principles, there is not that big difference between the narration of Bukhari and narration of Ibn Ishaq. Both of them are on the same level. Okay, so now uh, that is the, the, the main matter. So, but isn't it that conflicting? So we have to choose one of them too. So I say name of Bukhari does not make his narration superior because he is one of many other great muhaddithin. Okay, so, so in terms of age of Sayyidah Aisha, I do not have 100% certainty answer. Mm. Okay. Yep. okay, we were speaking about, um, you know, in some cases, in some cultures where very old men marry very young girls, yeah, yeah. maybe they're nine years old, yeah. and they might marry a 70-year-old man. It's not permissible in Islam for them to consummate the marriage. No, no, yeah, I, they I can did, sign a contract. No, yeah, 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 of course. Mm. I, I did mention it. I did mm. mention it in, within that segment that uh, so marriage of immature couple is valid if it is set up only by parents or guardian. But in terms of consummating the marriage, it's only permissible Islamically after the maturity age. Okay, so I did mention it. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so just coming back to the issue of uh, this age of Sayyid Aisha, as I said, because the narrations are conflicting. So uh, I do not have certainty. And even if one narration 
would be taken that does not give you certainty because only it is khabarul ahad you understand okay so that's uh, quite important and also the narration of ibn ishaq is very um, uh, you can say uh, clear cut so in one place he mentions that she was one of those who accepted the islam in very early stage within the first 3 years of like a message mission okay and but after that he comes back in some of the copies of the manuscript comes back to mention what Bukhari mentioned okay but regardless to that we have many other many other you can say a hadith which shows each of them show different you can say age uh, uh, of Sayyid Aisha while uh, marriage took a place okay so anyway so I think the key point of this issue is the name of Imam Bukhari Imam Bukhari is very great muhaddith only muhaddith scholar but we had many other great muhaddith scholars for me Imam Malik in the knowledge of hadith is as a minimum 10 times above uh, Imam Bukhari but then how come that Imam Bukhari is so famous I say uh, he was not that famous during his century Ahmad ibn Hanbal was much more famous Ali ibn al-Madini okay Sufyan Thori ibn Uyayna okay and Layth ibn Sa'ad many others they were stars of the uh, field called hadith but when exactly name of Bukhari became that famous I say in my own understanding Wallah alam it is um, it started off by Hakim Nesapuri. Okay, so Hakim Nesapuri uh, is, you can say, Sunni slash Shia scholar. Okay, not Rafadi, but Shia. Okay, so he had this uh, Shia, you can say, inclination. And uh, he is from the 4th century. So that is the beginning of the name of Bukhari rising. Okay, and it uh, became very big by uh, Ibn Salah. Okay, Shafi Ibn Salah, um, Shah Razuri. So, but uh, so that so uh, Muqaddim of Ibn Salah, that is the book made Imam Bukhari such you can say a big name. But I do not believe that Bukhari is absolute, you can say, um, authority in Islam. He is one of many other great muhaddithin. Okay, beside him, we have uh, Ibn Abi Shayba, glorious scholars, Abdul Razak al Sunani, Imam Nasai. Okay. And um, uh, Al Imam al Darimi, Samarkandi. Okay. Uh, by the way, the, do you know the Thulathiyat? Uh, Thulathiyat means the ahadith in which between author of the book and Rasulullah Islam, three names. So in Bukhari, we have uh, something uh, about 20, okay, 21 or 22, them type of, you can say, a hadith with very short uh, chain. But Imam Samarkandi, okay, um, uh, Imam Samarkandi al, uh, al Darimi, so not it's not Uthman bin Said, which is very late, but Samarkandi Darmi, Abdul Rahman bin Abdullah Ad Darmi. So Thulathiyat in his book, in his Sunan, is much more than in the Sahih collection of Imam Bukhari. So Darmi is not less okay in the knowledge uh, than Bukhari. So we have many many authorities. Okay, so uh, appointing one scholar as main authority in Islam. Obviously, I never take it. No one takes it. But unless maybe we have these, uh, you can say, non-qualified uh, scholars or uh, ignorant Muslims, just uh, lay people, they may take it. Okay, so even they're taking, the ignorant people, they're taking uh, very latest scholars, maybe from last century, they're taking them as like uh, absolute authorities in Islam. Okay, so you can expect it from the ignorant people. But educated people and the academicals they do not do that okay so just go to any of the books for example the books of uh, Jassas okay books of any of uh, the scholars from any of the madahib you see them make quoting a hadith from many many you can say scholars muhaddithin many muhaddithin okay not only Bukhari okay so that's quite important so I think I think the issue which made the age of Aisha be to be six and nine that popular it is only the name of Bukhari okay so that is the whole story about this you can say the issue about the age of say that yeah, and, and it's something that I think many non-muslims believe it's that it's not even questioned it's for many people Muslim and no, non-muslim no, no, it's seen as you, you you pointed on very you can say magic word not questioned so this why is not questioned I said because of the name of Bukhari Questioning Bukhari is very close to questioning God. You understand? Mm. 
for contemporary Muslims, regardless whatever their madhhab is. Beside Malikis, Malikis are very brainy people because their Imam is Muhaddith also, so they do question Bukhari. But Shafi'is, Hanbalis, and contemporary Hanafis, for them, questioning Bukhari is nearly questioning God. Mm. Okay, so for me, Bukhari is one of the uh, Muslims, great scholar of Hadith, but he's not absolute authority in each single field of Islam and not even in Hadith. He's not absolute authority. And, and this is where we go back to um, the establishment of truth or to your quest to find the truth. It's 100%. you have to question. Of course. Of you course, have to yeah, question yeah. everything. Of course, yeah. For me, absolute authority in Islam is only Quran. Yeah. I question even Abu Hanifa. We Hanafis just go to any, I mean, genuine scholar, Hanafi scholar, ask him what are the, uh, what is the percent uh, of the opinions of Abu Hanifa that you reject in your Hanafi madhab? Definitely, he will say, if he's educated, he will say, as a minimum, one-third of his opinions rejected. You understand? So our Imam is Abu Hanifa, but we rejected as a minimum one-third of his opinions. Okay, so uh, as you can see, it's it's big thing. Okay, I think that is just amazing thing also. It trains you to consider human being as a human being, not as a God. So absolute authority in Islam is Mm. Quran, not Bukhari, not Abu Hanifa, not Ibn Taymiyyah, and not Malik. And it means also when people come to you with with questions about what you believe, yeah, yeah. you can actually answer back to them because whatever they say to you, you've already questioned it before them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yes. you still come to that yeah, same conclusion. Of course, conclusion. yeah, yeah. yeah yes. so, so that is a very important thing. So we should not uh, tie up the religion of Islam with the name of a scholar, one scholar. Regardless, how great is that scholar? Okay, but if you attach, if you tie up the religion of Islam with Quran, I say such amazing thing. Everyone besides that questionable. Okay, can yeah. you imagine? Even God was questioned by angels. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So why Bukhari cannot be questioned by Muslims? Why mm. not? So is that's Bukhari an, very good much above God? For contemporary, for some of the groups of contemporary Islam, yes, Bukhari is much above God. Questioning him is kufr. But angels, when Allah said, I'm going to create um, a succeeder on earth. So God was questioned by angels. So they said, Ataj'alu fiha. So A is questioning, questioning letter. Are you going to create someone who will, blood the, uh, who will shed the blood because of rejecting the Bukhari? <laughs> and uh, who will create a mess so they question God and God is just does not oppress so God answered the question practically okay so I say that is just amazing that is just amazing okay so yeah but now not only Bukhari even very recent uh, you can say scholars of Islam who died maybe only a few decades ago questioning them is sign of kufr Yes, so it is practically believing that their imams are above God. Okay, mm. so, yeah, but obviously I don't believe in the imams and I don't follow the imams. Only if they are giving me truth, then I may accept. Yeah, and it, it's illogical to say don't question because yeah. um, to say don't question is to suggest that, you, that the answer is not going to be good enough. Yeah, yeah, because they, they, they are afraid of the question because they don't have a knowledge. Okay, so, so anyway, regardless to that. So then uh, the second question was um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, Sayyida Aisha and the, uh, why she was that beloved to Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Muhammad would s uh, spend much more longer time with her than the rest of the wives. Obviously, uh, this is incorrect. Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu was salam, he is the man of justice. He came from the God who is the God of justice, okay? Ras uh, Rasulullah cannot order us to apply the justice and then he will be unjust. Okay, so we do not accept that argument which says that Prophet would spend much more time giving to her than to his other wives. We do not accept it. Rasulullah was perfectly just. There could be some few narrations here there, okay, which in my own understanding definitely is fabricated by these heretics who wanted to prove that God is unju unjust, mm. oppressive, 
So the Prophet Muhammad is also unjust and oppressive. Obviously, the ramifications of that include um, people who do have more than one wife today. They may then think it's justified to yeah, treat yeah, them equally. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, so all the time, yeah. So all the time, whenever they fabricated some hadith, they have some good reason be behind that. There is a reason for fabrication. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are done by accident, though, aren't they? It's forgetful I, memory. And um, I don't... Yeah, no. it could be. Well, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> King, about the Prophet, peace be upon him, his uh, wives. Did they get along? Yeah, you, you know, it's, uh, again, another just very nice question and very important question. Look, uh, we do not believe that uh, Sahaba, including the ladies of Prophet Muhammad, they were angels. We do not believe in that. Okay, so they were human beings. They used to sleep, they used to have a food, okay? So it's very possible for all of them to happen, whatever happens to the human being. No one rejects that. Not uh, Ahlul Sunnah, not Shia, no one rejects that. Okay, so they're human beings. So all of them are quite possible, yes. Uh, but only the thing which uh, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah believe about this matter is uh, they actually, if, even if they would commit a sin or commit something which is incorrect, I mean the Sahaba, including the ladies of Prophet Muhammad, they would not insist on committing that sin, but they would repent. So that is our stance as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And also, same thing is applicable on uh, this incident which happened between Sayyidah Aisha, uh, supported by a uh, few Sahaba, Zubair al Awam and uh, uh, Talhat ibn Ubaidillah, and few other Sahaba on one side and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib on the other side okay so we as Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah we do believe that uh, Imam Ali had full right to do whatever he did okay and even Prophet Muhammad um, uh, supported predicted what's going to happen and supported the stance of um, of uh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib so he said many many ahadith okay uh, like uh, privately secretly to him to Imam Ali and publicly to all of the Sahaba. Okay, so we can only now narrate the uh, public, uh, like a hadith which Prophet said publicly, because whatever Prophet said to uh, Ali radiallahu about these type of incidents, so uh, Imam Ali did not release everything. Okay, but anyway, so one of the most famous things about what happened in that uh, uh, time is that uh, uh, Imam Ali will be fighting against the rebellions. Rebelling, according to Islam, is a major sin. Okay, so uh, so that is a very strong, you can say, support from Prophet Muhammad towards Imam Ali, even Abu Talib. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, well, obviously, what do you expect from this uh, person, Imam Ali, who was adopted son of Prophet Muhammad, who is trained and taught, disciplined by Prophet Muhammad? What do you expect from him? Okay. Uh, so you expect only that truth and being so, you can say, uh, smooth and quick toward the truth. Okay, and Prophet supported that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying that uh, uh, you will be fighting against uh, the rebellions and uh, saying that Zubair ibn al-Awam will be fighting against Imam Ali and Imam Ali will be oppressed, mazlum, oppressed person. Okay, means whatever had been done towards Imam Ali, that was incorrect. Okay, so anyway, so that is the thing. And I really don't like uh, to go into the details because it is history. And history is written by historians and you never know who are these historians. Okay, even if some of the Muslim sects and groups glorify these names of the historians, but I don't trust any of them. I say yes, possible. Okay, history is not a science for me. History is just stories. Could be right, could be wrong. But it's not one plus one equals two. It's not that. Mm. Okay, history, yeah, this guy is saying such and such. The other guy will say something opposite. I will say, yeah, it's a good thing to, to know. But now leave me alone, let me study. Yeah, because everybody um, has their own experiences of things. No. which is going to impact the way they narrate yeah, to no, other no, people. Yes, so, so regardless to that, I don't believe history. I don't trust history at all. History is just nonsense. Just stories, you never know what was the, the, the actual thing. So you don't see any reason to trust it? There's no reason to trust for, it. For me, it's 50-50. Maybe yes, maybe not. Hmm. Okay, yeah, but the, but the certainty, the certainty is, for example, signs. Okay, or for example, the logic conclusions. Okay, or maths. That is certainty. 
like a history if it is narrated by Quran yes of course but if it is when it says Dhahabi Ibn Lathir Tobari I say yeah good yeah but 50 50 they could be right they could be wrong yeah so that's my stance about this uh, history but 100 percent Imam Ali was on the truth in there and happened whatever happened and he's oppressed he has been killed his uh, children have been killed and all of them are oppressed people and God is the um, the justice okay God will uh, so anyway so about the Sahaba we are Sunnah al Jama'ah we do not say that they are angels okay but what we say is they may commit sins but they do not insist on it so that is the stance of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah so that's the overall thing yeah. mm, okay